Here's an example of applying just one aspect of swallowing function, and that is airway protection. So this is penetration, aspiration, and residue displayed in two different patients with the same penetration, aspiration, scale score, and similar oropharyngeal residue. If you look at the patient on your left and the patient on your right, they have the same penetration aspiration scale score. That is, they are an eight. The material enters below the vocal folds with no effort to, re to eject the bolus. And there's a majority of the bolus con contained in the pharyngeal recesses after the initial swallow. However, if we look at the physiology of patient on your left versus patient on your right, they're very different causes of aspiration and residue. So for example, the patient on your left has problems, the primary problem being um, decreased tongue base retraction. And if you look at the patient on your right, your primary physiologic impairment is no visible initiation of the pharyngeal swallow. So surrogate information for a significant sensory deficit for patient number two. So we're going to treat patient on the left very differently than the patient on the right. And we're going to focus on tongue base retraction on the patient on the left. So we'll do more strength based training that we'll talk about later in the program versus sensory facilitation for the patient on the right. Unfortunately, even though we have validated metrics for describing the underlying physiology, in reality, the types of reporting that we see from some clinicians are the patient was given various consistencies of barium, there was laryngeal penetration with thin barium, residue cleared with a repeat swallow, and the recommendation is nectar thick liquids and a pureed diet. So in a recommendation or with results and recommendations such as this, they're very nonspecific to the referring clinician. They don't tell us anything about the underlying mechanism, nor does the treatment plan target the underlying mechanism. Rather, the recommendation is only for a modified diet. Modified diets are certainly useful as frontline tactics that we'll describe later, but our job, whenever possible, is to treat the swallowing mechanism to facilitate improved swallowing function. When penetration and aspiration are provided in and of themselves with no other additional information, it undermines the complexity of the swallowing mechanism and impairment, and it also undermines the complexity of our skills as clinicians. Anybody can identify or be trained to identify penetration, aspiration, and residue. The real knowledge and skill is to be able to identify deficits in the underlying mechanism of swallowing in order to target your treatment. Also, simplicity does not imply reliability. There is a notion that simple scales for penetration, aspiration, detection, and residue are easy metrics to apply and that they are reliable. However, reliability is dependent on training and there are nuances in scoring that can significantly change the result. So one should not assume that because one clinician is using the penetration aspiration scale or residue scale or any scale, that their results are going to be the same as another clinician if they have not been reliability trained and if there has not been some assessment of reliability, even if that means assessment within your own cohort in your department. We will not advance our swallowing interventions if we do not understand the mechanism of their effect. It doesn't matter what kind of interventions we're referring to, whether or not it be surgery, an assisted device, a strength-based intervention, or a skill-based intervention. I always go back to the importance of guided intervention which requires a standardized assessment that has the attributes of content validity, construct validity, and clinical validity, reliability, both intra-rater and inter-rater, 
a scale or a tool that is physiologic-based versus symptom-based in order to detail the mechanism of impairment in order to guide treatment. Whatever tool you're using has to be clinically practical. Speech-language pathologists are sometimes doing four, five, up to six swallow studies in one day. They have to be executed quickly, and they have to be analyzed fairly quickly offline after the examination in order to formulate your report. Whatever tool you use should be demonstrated for linkage to clinical action. That it's not just reporting checklists, that what you're reporting is going to change the management of the patient.